So welcome as you uh, join us uh, for worship today and wherever you are may you know uh, the peace of God as we meet together in his presence. I want to start with uh, some verses from Paul's letter to the Ephesians as I call. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus, to the saints who are in Trinity, in all different parts of the country, place your place name in there. To the saints who are in and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Amen.
And so we come to God in prayer. Before the world began, outside of time, beyond our understanding, before the beginning, God. Fathering history, mothering creation, parenting earth's people. God, in the right moment, preparing the right way, revealing the right person for each new beginning. God, we come to you, receiving your grace and acceptance, even before we say sorry. Enfolded in your love, even when we don't deserve it. Touched with the fire of your spirit to continue that work of redemption, renewal, transformation. In these moments, we meet with you, our risen, redeeming Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The reading is taken from Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 1 to 9. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways. As if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near to them. Why have we fasted? they say, and you have not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrelling and strife, and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today, and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter. When you see the naked, to clothe him, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. Matthew 22, verses 34 to 46. Hearing that Jesus had signed the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them said, an expert in law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about Christ? <clears throat> Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is, that, how is it then that David, speaking by spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord to, said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one would say a word in reply. From that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Good morning. Today in the Living Faithless series, I'm looking at worrying about religion. 
And in reflecting on this, I'm using the Isaiah reading that Pritchard uses, but also uh, focusing mainly on Matthew 22, verses 34 to 46. The first question I want to ask is, is religion really a contentious issue? Well, the answer to a question like this is always yes and no. Nietzsche declared, God is dead. God remains dead and we have killed him. It's interesting that the last part of the quotation is not often used. If the idea of God and religion is a problem in the world, whose fault is it? The easy answer, and the one often used by many, if not all religions, including Christianity, is that it's their fault, the other religions. But now, besides the other religions to contend with, religions of the world have a very forthright, if not evangelical, atheists who will tell us that all the problems of the world are caused by religion. Let us, though, not shy away from such charges and begin admitting that religion and that religion, and that's all religions, are fallible. Pritchard, when talking about religion in Living Faithfully, says, It's the receptacle, receptacle we use to carry out faith. And like any human construct, no matter how faithful the intention or the designers, it's inevitable, inevitably vulnerable to human folly. But to say that many of the ills of the world are the fault of religion is not untrue. But we also need to remember that also many of the good things in the world have come through people with faith, whether that faith is Christian or not. I think then if we are to consider how to respond to the criticism that is lodged at us as Christians, we need to hold in mind the words of Christ when he gave us the two commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbour as yourself. In many ways, Jesus didn't give us two commandments because you can't have one without the other. If I don't love my neighbour, I can't love God and vice versa. This is not just about how we might feel about someone. It's about our commitment to our neighbour and seeking to enable the lives of all to be more fully human, more con connected to God. It's a choice we make every day, to love or not to love. I wonder what that love looks like. I wonder what our lives and the lives of those who are our neighbours would be like if we held these two commandments as the guiding principles for all that we do. What would be created? What changes would we see? What kind of world do we want to live in? It's a big question and one that we will all give differing answers to. But fundamentally, I think the Christian response is, I want to live in a world with dignity. When thinking about religion, and again, not only thinking about the Christian faith, I want a world in which different religions and beliefs are valued and viewed as a means for all to meet the divine. I want a world in which diversity and difference are celebrated rather than oppressed. A world in which people of, of na uh, where people and nations are at peace with themselves and one another. I want a world in which we face and, and learn from our past mistakes and failures, failures so that we can do and be better. I want a world in which everyone has employment, a living wage, education opportunities, access to healthcare, safe and decent housing and enough to eat. I want a world in which people are not judged by the colour of their skin, by their gender, by their sexuality, whether they are rich or poor, by their religion. I don't want to judge, but I know I do. And I know I need to seek forgiveness when I do. I wonder what you would add to the list or even take away from the list. Ultimately, that list points to a world in which we love God and our neighbour as ourselves. <clears throat> the love Jesus speaks about is all or nothing. 
we love God first of first or not at all. We love everyone or no one. Augustine says, the measure of love is to love without measure. Another quote I came across was, the mark of really loving someone or something is unconditionality and excess, engagement and commitment, fire and passion. The mark of Christian discipleship is always to first Sorry, the mark of Christian discipleship is always to first focus on Jesus. We're called to follow in his way. I've had people say to me, and I understand where they're coming from and what they're trying to say. They say, I'm not religious, I'm a disciple. That is to be commended, absolutely. But as Pritchard says in Living Faithfully, religion is, is as important to faith as marriage is to love. Religion is the way and means by which we carry out our faith. Religion is how we do things, whether that is formally or informally. As Christians, though, we still live in a world where religion, in its negative connotations, has an impact. And to help us, Pritchard says, if we are worried about religion and the negative impact it can have on society, one response is to learn more and go deeper. It's easy to accept second-hand opinions peddled by those who have made a life out of negativity. The great religious traditions each have an ocean of wisdom of which most of us know only a thimbleful. As world citizens, we could do, we could do with learning more about the riches of, for example, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism. The Christian tradition is an extraordinary source of spiritual riches, theology, fascination, practical wisdom, and human sanctity. You may enjoy fishing in other rivers, but the Christian river is deep, wide, and rich. In our society today, there is much criticism about focused on religion, and often, this is focused on the church, and in many cases, this is correct. But what this passage from the gospel today teaches us is, is that we are not to shy away from that criticism, not to shrink into the background, but that we are by the way we love God and the way that we love our neighbour, that we endeavour to correct the mistakes of the past, the mistakes of the present, and seek dignity for all. Amen.
So we come to our prayers for others and for ourselves. Let us pray. We pray for the coming of God's kingdom. You sent your son to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom to captives and salvation to your people. Anoint us with your spirit. Rouse us to work in his name. Loving God, by your spirit, Bring in your kingdom. Send us to bring help to the poor and freedom to the oppressed. Be close to those who feel beyond reach. Loving God, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to speak out and proclaim your justice in the world. Let those who feel unnoticed glimpse justice and be given hope and courage. Loving God, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to tell the world the good news of your healing love. Let those in need of healing and those who care and support them find a place of wholeness and healing and peace. Loving God, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to those who mourn, to bring joy and gladness as well as acknowledging pain and loss. May they know your presence, your hope and your peace. Loving God, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to proclaim that the time is here for you to save your people. Loving God, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Lord of the church, hear our prayer and make us one in mind and heart to serve you in Christ our Lord, to bring hope to this your world and to all of your creation. Amen. And together we say the Lord's Prayer in whatever form your uh, practice is and whatever language your practice is. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
so thank you for joining with us as we've worshipped together and may you go knowing this blessing gracious God as we respond to your call in our lives nurture within us the wisdom to respect your gift of life and your creation may the roots of our faith be strengthened so that we may reflect your kingdom values of justice peace hope and life for all we pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. And the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.